kick us off. Absolutely. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. We're excited to have a big crowd of folks uh, this morning. My name is Michelle Probert. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the director of the Office of Main Care Services, and I am uh, pleased to have Commissioner Jean Lambrew here with us this morning, who is going to kick us off with a few words. Commissioner. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. Given the topic of this forum, I expect you are all participating out of a shared interest in preserving health coverage in Maine when we move out of the COVID-19 public health emergency. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Secretary Becerra, and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS Administrator uh, Chiquita brooks Lashore, will give all states 60 days notice before the expiration of this public health emergency. As we'll hear later, the earliest end date is likely January 11th. As such, it is time to plan. Our capable team will spend this time walking you through and soliciting feedback on our plan and how you can help. But before talking about what is to come, I'd like to talk about where we've been. I met many of you for the first time in January 2019 at the ice vault in Hallowell as we took on the governor's directive to expand Medicaid. Beth Ham, Tony Pilot, Dan Cohen, who are here today, as well as the other Office of Family Independence team, Leah, et cetera, were ready to implement at the department. But we could not have succeeded without you there helping to sign people up. I was brought to tears when one of you told me about a woman with lung cancer who enrolled in those initial days of the expansion, who for the first time had hope. We then turned to restoring eligibility for programs like the Medicare Savings Program and the Drugs for the Low-Income Elderly. We improved behavioral health and reproductive health services in main care in that first year. And under Michelle Perber's leadership, as well as that of the Office of Main Care Services, we launched a comprehensive rate system evaluation, recognizing that access and quality care can only be provided when main care payments are sufficient. They are inextricably linked. That plan is now law with significant improvements underway. We also recognize that main care is part of our public private coverage system and set to work to improve the affordability and accessibility of private insurance. One of the first laws signed by Governor Mills was LD1, which codified the Affordable Care Act's consumer protections, including those critical protections for people with pre-existing conditions. We engaged with you all in the summer and fall of 2019, alongside the Health Coverage, Insurance, and Financial Services co-chairs and committee to explore ideas to improve affordability. And in March 2020, with the dark clouds of COVID-19 pandemic overhead, with leadership from the governor, Beth Bosing in the governor's office, and the Bureau of Insurance, we got the Made for Maine Health Coverage Act across the finish line on a unanimous vote. Simultaneously at that time, we launched our COVID-19 pandemic response. It is hard to exaggerate how much work Maine put in to keeping its residents and frontline workers safe during the pandemic. That effort has received high marks from independent organizations. For example, the Commonwealth Fund ranked Maine's performance the best in the continental US. We don't count Hawaii, but I think we're proud of our continental US uh, ranked number one. And the National Bureau of Economic Review, uh, I'm sorry, National Business and Economic Review, or NBER analysis that looked at our overall response beyond public health gave Maine an A. And this is despite the fact that at the beginning of the pandemic, my colleague, Heather Johnson, the Commissioner of Economic and Community Development, flagged a study warning us that Maine was viewed as the most vulnerable state due to its older population and reliance on tourism. Despite that enormous effort, our work on improving coverage in Maine continued relentlessly. Maine Care created its own COVID-19 coverage option for the uninsured, independent of the federal program that started later and ended earlier. In 2021, we implemented reduced out-of-pocket costs for primary care and behavioral health care in our state insurance regulated plans. And in 2022, the Bureau of Insurance simplified copays and deductibles through clear choice standardized plans, which is a big relief to consumers who struggle to figure out how to shop 
with all those confusing deductibles and copies. Also in 2021, the CMS administrator came to Maine to announce the approval and to, approval for and celebration of the launch of CoverMe.gov. Thanks to the work of Meg Garrett-Reed and her new Office of Health Insurance Marketplace, the first open enrollment in 20, for 2022 of CoverMe.gov enrolled 66,095 people, a 10% increase over 2021, which reverses declines in the marketplace plan selection since 2017. Given the extension of premium tax credits in the Inflation Reduction Act, we expect to see this progress continue. And as a bridge for the Made for Maine small business reforms, the Maine Jobs and Recovery Plan launched a premium relief program in November 2021. It is providing $50 per worker, more for families, to maintain coverage during the economic recovery for small businesses. Through August, the program has, served, has saved small businesses and their workers in Maine $20 million. It has helped 5,764 small businesses and 46,348 people, employees and their families. On the horizon for small businesses in January is the start of Maine's recently approved state innovation waiver amendment. We received improve, approval in July for a waiver to pool the individual and small group insurance markets and extend reinsurance for that pool market. The results are in. Small business premiums on average will fall in 2023 for the first time since at least 2021. This, is quant this will save on average $860 per person in 2023 or more than $70 per month. This is against a backdrop of fairly large premium increases for sm small businesses in every other New England state. The last legislative session also produced, um, also produced major improvements for the main care system. This includes 12 months of postpartum coverage for women, coverage of immigrant pregnant women and children, an expansion of the Children's Health Insurance Program, and a long-awaited comprehensive adult dental benefit in Maine Care. We will spend the morning talking about Maine Care, the maintenance of effort policy, and the changes coming in January. But I wanted to pause and say thank you. We have made a difference coming together to work on coverage in Maine. Maine's uninsured rate dropped by the largest amount of any state in the nation between 2019 and 2021. 27% fewer people are uninsured in Maine. So there are people who can get timely care, who don't have to choose between food and medicine, and who have peace of mind of knowing that they can get hospital care or emergency care when they need it without going bankrupt. So thank you. And let's get to work on how we can keep people coverage covered. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Meg or Michelle. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, it is uh, inspiring and even a little bit daunting to look back at all that has uh, happened over the past three years um, and what we have done to, to get through that. Uh, so I am very pleased uh, this morning that we will be um, coordinating on a presentation to you all on the public health emergency. We have the Office of Health Insurance Marketplace, the Office of Main Care Services, and the Office for Family Independence all represented here today, as well as the Commissioner's Office. And so to kick us off, we can start screen sharing, um, and we will each uh, tell you a little bit about our offices and also introduce other team members who we have with us here today. So once that PowerPoint is up, there it goes. Uh, we'll go to Tony Pilot, Director Pilot first. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm the director of the Office for Family Independence. My name is uh, Tony Pilot. Uh, we provide social service eligibility for SNAP and TANF programs in the state of Maine, but most importantly, in the focus of our discussion today, we also do eligibility for Maine Care. Thanks, Tony. Would you like to introduce other team members today as well? I'd be happy to. Uh, with us is Senior Program Manager of Maine Care, Leah Stedholm as well as OFI's Chief Operating Officer, Dan Cohen. Great, thank you. 
And again, my name is Michelle Probert. I am the director for Maine Care. Maine Care is the name for Maine's Medicaid program. Uh, and Maine Care receives funding from both the state and federal government to provide free or low cost health insurance to low income Mainers. And this health insurance enables um, Mainers across the state uh, to be able to get the care that they need to leave lead healthy and uh, productive lives and be able to be an integrated part of their communities. Um, and I will just call out that uh, many people often don't recognize the relationship that the Office for Family Independence has with the Office for Main Care Services. So we work very closely together um, and have been working closely together on the plan for the public health emergency as well. Um, so I just wanted to call out that relationship. And uh, with me today, I have uh, Eric Isley, who is our Director of Communications and Planning. Meg. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm Meg Garrett-Reed. I am the Director of the Office of the Health Insurance Marketplace. And as the Commissioner uh, said, we launched last year, um, essentially replacing healthcare.gov as the platform for individuals and families uh, in Maine who don't qualify for other coverage like Maine Care or uh, coverage through their employer um, to come and apply for financial assistance from the federal government uh, and to shop for and enroll in a plan. So uh, we do also um, assess eligibility for Maine Care when individuals apply through our platform, uh, but really here today to talk about um, the options for a continuum of coverage for individuals who become ineligible uh, for mean care at the end of the public health emergency. Um, and joining me today is our Senior Advisor for Outreach, Emily Barson, who has been uh, running point on this effort for our office. Thanks. Thank you, Meg. And last but not least, uh, Beth, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Sure thing. Good morning, everyone. And my name is Beth Ham, one of three deputy commissioners here um, at the Department of Human Health and Human Services. And it's been my pleasure to work with this very competent and dedicated team on behalf of the commissioner's office as we um, as we work on the public health emergency unwinding. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. All right, so for the agenda today, we have three main points that we are going to be going through. One, we're just going to talk about what is the public health emergency and why is that important to all of us and to the main care members and individuals who we serve. Uh, second, we're going to talk about um, those implications, specific implications for Maine as a state, as well as for main care members. And third, and I will say most importantly, we're going to talk about our plan as well as the help that we uh, are looking to many of you for in order to make sure that as many people as possible maintain health insurance coverage, whether that is through Maincare or through uh, CoverMe.gov. I will note that because we've got robust participation today, um, uh, we are doing this in a panel format. Uh, please, we highly encourage you to share any questions you have uh, in the chat. Um, those will be coming to uh, the panelists and we will be trying to respond to those as we are able throughout the presentation. Depending on, um, depending on volume, we might not get to ev answer every single question, but we will absolutely be noting the questions uh, so that we can update our own FAQs and the information that we put out there going forward. Uh, we have a fair amount of information to get through, but our hope is that we will be able to answer, um, excuse me, that we will be able to wrap up the presentation in time uh, to be able to have um, question and answer dialogue at the end of the presentation. All right, so with that, uh, up first is the topic of what is the public health emergency to begin with? Um, I will note that there has been some national polling of Medicaid members across the country and the truth is, is that um, very few Medicaid members and probably very few people, uh, period, are aware of what the public health emergency is. Uh, so it is not actually specific to COVID-19. U.S. Health and Human Services has the authority to declare public health emergencies. Uh, they uh, may do so, for example, in the case of a hurricane, and it is really a declaration that enables uh, greater flexibility as well as assistance to go to states in time of need. Uh, what was uh, a bit different about COVID-19 is that obviously it was a national and global pandemic. And so this was a, a nationally declared public health emergency that uh, the US Health and Human Services declared on January 31st, 2020. Um, 
public health emergencies, and I may say PHE for short uh, because I'm used to doing that, um, uh, as a rule uh, and per federal um, statute are declared for 90 day periods. That's, that's the way that, um, that they are set up. And so uh, at the end of 90 days, uh, if there is still a public health emergency, then uh, the PHE will get extended for another 90 days. And since the COVID-19 PHE was declared on January 31st of 2020, it has been continuously extended for 90 days ever since. Uh, so the commissioner noted in her introductory remarks that um, Health and Human Services has provided uh, their commitment and assurance to um, states and governors across the country that uh, they will give us at least 60 days notice before the public health emergency is going to end. Um, so technically the 90 day period that we're in right now is set to expire on October 12th, 2022. But because we are uh, well within that 60 day window prior to October 12th, and there was not a notice um, of the ending of the public health emergency, there is broad confidence across the country that the public health emergency on October 12th is going to be extended for another 90 days, um, at least. Uh, and so that would mean that at the earliest, uh, the public health emergency would end in mid-January of 2023. Um, and there is the potential that it could be extended again at that point. All right, next slide. So why, why is this public health emergency um, important and what does it mean? Um, so I'll give a little bit more background. So the Families First Coronavirus Response Act became law in March of 2020, um, and it provided additional federal matching dollars to Medicaid programs across the country if Medicaid programs um, agreed uh, and demonstrated that they would meet maintenance of effort uh, requirements, also called continuous coverage requirements. So those maintenance of effort or MOE requirements means that um, even if individuals lose, uh, even if individuals, for example, um, got a new job and started receiving more income, uh, that would typically make them ineligible for Medicaid and they would need to be terminated from the program. During the public health emergency, states need to keep those individuals enrolled. And so it is very standard practice, and Tony will talk a little bit more about this, uh, that individuals who enroll in Medicaid, including main care, um, need to regularly demonstrate that they are still eligible. And uh, if they don't respond to a request for additional information, um, or if they do respond and show they're not eligible, they usually will lose coverage. But since uh, the public health emergency, since the pandemic, that has, that has not happened. Um, so there are very few circumstances that are exceptions. For example, if an individual, uh, a main care member requests to be disenrolled, then we will disenroll them. If they pass away, uh, they are disenrolled. And um, if we know that they have changed residency to another state, then they are also disenrolled. But otherwise, uh, individuals uh, have not been terminated from coverage. We have continued to ask for updated information um, for renewal purposes. That is something that the federal government has encouraged all states to do. So we have as up-to-date information as possible, uh, but we have not um, acted on that information for part. Um, so I'll just I'll just point out that uh, it puts us in it puts all states in a bit of an awkward situation because on one hand we've continued to ask members to update their information and that it's important to get back to us. But on the other hand, we haven't actually acted on the information that they've sent us. And so we've kind of set up a dynamic or an expectation that like, it's really not that important. And when you also think about the fact that this has happened during uh, main care expansion in the state of Maine, we have a lot of individuals who are receiving coverage through main care for the first time. And so this just seems normal to them. Um, and I'll also state that national polling has indicated that 
Uh, most Medicaid members across the country also don't realize that these are special circumstances or that anything has been different during the pandemic in terms of their ability to maintain coverage. So there's uh, the potential for a big disconnect between uh, what um, will happen at the end of the public health emergency, which we'll be getting to, and expectations of, of members. All right, so once the PHE ends, um, states are going to need to review the eligibility of every person who is enrolled in their Medicaid program and for individuals who are no longer eligible or individuals who just do not respond, whether because they didn't get the information or because they chose not to respond, um, those individuals need to be disenrolled. Uh, the federal government has um, call this the unwinding. It is not my favorite term. I don't know who came up with it. Not a marketing expert, I don't think, but uh, but it is broadly used across the country. So I think it's a little bit too late to fight back on that name. But this process of catching up with eligibility and disenrolling individuals who are no longer eligible is referred to as the unwinding. So once the public health emergency ends, states have 12 months from the end to make sure that they have started that redetermination process, the process of um, checking to make sure if individuals are still eligible for all enrolled members. And then there's a couple more months at the end there that states have in order to complete that redetermination process. So just as an example, because as a reminder, we still don't know when precisely the PHE is going to end, but if we um, assume that the PHE ends in January of 2023, we should hear in mid-November from the federal government um, if that is the plan to end the PHE uh, in January. If the PHE then ends in January, uh, then um, we will still need to uphold those MOE requirements where individuals need to stay enrolled until the end of that month, until the end of January. Uh, and then starting then, uh, there is a year for OFI, the Office for Family Independence, to make their way through everyone enrolled in main care to check on their eligibility. All right, uh, I just wanna remind folks again, feel free to put questions in the chat and we'll try to respond to those as we are able. And I will turn it to Director Pilat to talk about implications for the state of Maine and main care members. And just briefly, sorry to jump in, um, just to make sure it's clear, there's a Q&A um, function. I think the broad chat is um, disabled, but if you're looking in the bottom menu um, on your screen, you should see Q&A, and that's where you can drop in a question um, if you'd like to pose one to us. Thanks. All right. Uh, this is my slide, and I, I, I recall myself uh, saying my name a couple times when I was initially introducing myself. And just for good measure, I put it in the chat in case anybody wants to uh, reach out to me uh, for further information. But the essential uh, gist of this slide here is that during the pandemic, um, OFI took some significant steps to ensure that folks would not lose their coverage during the health emergency. So when folks returned their reviews, we accepted what was put on the document returned to us without requesting any verification information from the individuals. We took a step to not penalize any households that didn't pay premiums on our premium programs like Cub Care and Katie Beckett. And for COVID-19 individuals, we covered things like vaccinations and testing. So OFI took uh, significant steps to ensure that we retained as many individuals for coverage as possible through the pandemic health emergency, and we still do that. So what does that mean for, for OFI? Um, and the state of Maine. Over that period of time to date, we've seen a 34% increase in individuals on Medicaid coverage here in Maine. Um, this is uh, obviously about 100,000 from the numbers that we're showing here on this slide. Many of those individuals will still be eligible 
but the requirements from the federal government indicate that our charge is to process each individual household for continuing eligibility once the pandemic has ended. So going back to what Michelle was giving for an overview on the timeline, once we know from the federal government that the health emergency is ending, states will have a little bit of time to step into a 12 month time period to work through the entire population of Maine care recipients in Maine and reassess them for continued eligibility. Next slide. So we have 12 months to review all, the entire population for Maine care. Um, and so what OFI is proposing is to work through the individual caseloads that we have and based on the established redetermination dates for those coverage groups, we will be sending out recertifications to households to have information provided that is current and reassess eligibility for that household. As the slide indicates, um, OFI will restart renewals over the 12 month time period based on what we already have in the system for redetermination dates. And some households with cub care and or medically needy coverage groups will actually receive their renewals within the first few months of the pandemic health emergency ending. The reality is, is as we process these recertifications, there will likely be some main care members that will lose coverage. Um, if we don't have updated contact information, you may not receive the notice. If we request documentation and it's not returned in the time period required, um, we may have to close your main care coverage. And even if the outcome for main care coverage for your household is to close those benefits, you will still have the opportunity to apply for insurance assistance through CoverMe.gov. So yeah, as Tony noted, um, you know, certainly some uh, risk for uh, members losing coverage at the end of the public health emergency. So having covered um, the obligations of uh, the Office for Family Independence, um, we also wanted to take some time covering the actions that we're taking um, to try to prevent that from happening um, in any case when an individual uh, is eligible for coverage. So um, just to, to sort of review, um, as Tony noted, ensuring uh, up-to-date contact information for members is extremely uh, important and we'll cover some actions we're taking um, to try to encourage and facilitate that. Um, also taking additional steps to try to maximize retention among individuals who remain eligible for main care by ensuring they have the information that they need about um, renewal steps. Um, and finally, additional steps that uh, the uh, CoverMe.gov and the Office of the Health Insurance Marketplace are taking for those individuals who are no longer eligible for main care um, to help them transition into other forms of affordable coverage if they need it. Um, so I'll hand it back. I think the next slide is, is uh, diving in a little bit more uh, into actions um, being taken to update contact information for members. So I think one of the key things for, for for a takeaway from today is to ensure that we have your contact information. It's going to be critical um, that we have your latest address information um, and that we have your latest household composition information, your latest income information. But it all starts with being able to communicate with you. And so, the importance of folks going to My Main Connection, which is OFI's social services application and recertification portal. That's a great way for us to receive your updated household information. Um, you can give us a call. We have a statewide number that's manned with many individuals. 
um, prepared to take your information so that we can update the most recent information for your household. Um, I think that just doing a couple of those little things, reaching out to us and providing your most recent contact information will go a long way towards ensuring OFI is able to assess your household situation and redetermine eligibility in a quick and timely manner. And again, if the outcome is, um, un is that you're no longer eligible, you will be able to explore insurance option coverages uh, through CoverMe.gov. And uh, one thing that we're doing to ensure that once we've sent out re redeterminations to households that folks are alerted to the importance of the document is the renewal form will be mailed in a blue striped envelope. And um, we spent many weeks and, and, of, and many hours with study groups to come up with the tagline if it's blue it's time to renew. Um, that, that is a joke, of course, um, <laughs> but uh, we do put some thought into the, to what is going to be critical. If you see this document with the blue stripe on it, please open it, please review it and complete it timely in return to the office in the self-addressed stamped envelope that will be included you can also go online and do your renewal. That would be even faster. Um, and that's at www.mymainconnection.gov. So here we have a renewal timeline that if the pandemic health emergency ends as, um, as what we were expecting, you can see that the renewal reminder notice would go out in January, and then the form itself would go out in March, and you would have essentially 45 days to get us the review so that we can then assess it for necessary verifications, if not included with the document, and then process for a determination. I think it's important to note that you do have some time to process the recertification. However, the sooner the better. We, as we saw from an earlier slide, there's a significant amount of individuals that are on our main care population that will need to be reviewed. And there's a very limited amount of time and resources to process these redeterminations in a timely fashion. So the sooner you can provide the document, the better. And also keep in mind that OFI stands by ready to assist with any potential needs for verification documentation. Some folks have a hard time, for example, getting their income information from their employer. Well, OFI, can help you with that. It is our charge to help you as much as we can to complete the redetermination for your main care eligibility. Just to highlight again, My Main Connection, we recently relaunched My Main Connection on July 25th. And I believe we're, we've signed up a significant amount of new users through the online service. It's there for you to apply for benefits, not just for main care, but all programs. You can also do your recertifications through My Main Connection and you can check on status. You can update information about your household. You can upload documents. I think that this will be a great avenue for folks who are looking to quickly provide the information necessary for us to do a main care eligibility redetermination.
And this just shows again, another uh, avenue for you to report a change to OFI by going to this particular page, you can do a change of information for current members. And it's three very simple steps for you to pr provide the latest information about your household. Again, contact information, we're gonna continue to highlight this, but updated phone, address, email information for your household is critical. And that will ensure that we are able to communicate with you and provide you the necessary documentation to ensure you do not lose your health insurance coverage. I'm gonna jump in for a quick second, just to answer some of the Q&A questions uh, related to the renewal process. So one of the questions was that if we received renewals during the public health emergency and they reported an income that was over, are they going to be automatically disenrolled or are they going to receive a brand new renewal? So every single main care member is going to get a, um, a new renewal. So they will have an opportunity to provide updated information to us um, before we make any new determination on their eligibility. Just a couple seconds. There's a couple questions about when we're going to start um, sending out notices. So as soon as we're informed of when the public health emergency is ending, we are going to immediately start telling the people that are up for renewal first um, that they are going to be coming up for renewal. So we'll be sending them a letter telling them, hey, look, be on the lookout for this blue striped envelope. Um, your renewal month is whatever month it is. Uh, and then the renewal form will be mailed out um, in that blue striped envelope for them to return. It is super, super important that we emphasize um, we need to make sure that renewals come back timely. As soon as they get them, they need to come back to us because if we have them, it ensures that we're not closing their coverage as we're processing it. If it comes in late, uh, there's a chance that the coverage will end automatically because we didn't get it back in time. And then there was a couple questions about the plan for renewals, when we're going to send renewals out, who's going to be renewed first. Uh, essentially, everybody that uh, applies for Medicaid and is enrolled has a 12 month renewal date. We are going to try to stick to that timeline. So, and I think there's a slide coming up here pretty soon that if they were uh, scheduled for renewal in July of 2023, that's when their renewal is going going to be, but keep in mind that we are going to be sending out that renewal notice ahead of time so people are aware of when their renewal is coming. And I think I'll save the rest of the Q&As for later so I can work through them. Go ahead, Meg. Thank you. Thanks, Leah. I'll try to give you some time to, to work through those. No, there's a lot of questions. Um, so I wanted to give a quick overview of CoverMe.gov, um, acknowledging that we are still um, somewhat new to the state of Maine, and there may be folks on the call who aren't familiar with what we do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we offer a platform um, for folks to apply and enroll in coverage, which is um, commercial uh, insurance coverage through private health insurance companies, so we don't administer the coverage ourselves. Um, but what does set CoverMe.gov apart is that all of the plans offered um, on our platform have to meet standards for quality and comprehensiveness of coverage. So if you work with um, patients, with consumers, you may have encountered folks who have gone online and Googled health insurance, found something that looks like a really good deal, um, only to find when they were seeking care that there were um, loopholes, you know, lots of fine print um, for what the plan does and doesn't cover. Um, all the plans offered on CoverMe.gov have to uh, cover 10 essential health benefits. So really the full range of expected um, services that folks are looking to access. Um, through their insurance, they can be very confident when they shop on CoverMe.gov that they are going to um, have that coverage. And uh, now with the new clear choice designs that have been introduced, um, also much simpler to comp compare options, um, really understand uh, the features of each plan um, and be able to shop based on the, the price of the plan monthly and the network as well. 
The other um, really important feature that sets us apart is that CoverMe.gov is the only place to apply for federal financial assistance um, that can make most make both the premiums um, for plans, so the monthly cost uh, that patients pay, um, as well as out-of-pocket costs in uh, many uh, cases more affordable. Um, really important, I think, particularly for a population of individuals who may be coming um, from main care, may not have been paying um, out-of-pocket costs when seeking care when they had main care, that um, through CoverMe.gov, especially folks sort of with incomes between 100 up to 200, 250% of the federal poverty level can get help to really significantly lower their deductible their co-insurance, their co-pays. Um, another great feature is that uh, just this year, um, additional federal financial assistance was extended through the Inflation Reduction Act through 2025. Um, so folks who previously didn't qualify, um, some higher income individuals, uh, those um, over 400% of, of the poverty level um, who are uh, older and still had really unaffordable coverage, um, didn't qualify and they do now. Um, and really importantly, also across the board, um, coverage or financial assistance is more generous um, for coverage than it was previously. So um, we have many, many people um, through CoverMe.gov who pay as little as one or two dollars a month um, for the coverage that they have through the marketplace. Um, and just to sort of add, eligibility um, through the marketplace really kind of picks up where main care uh, leaves off uh, for members. So um, depending on eligibility levels and, and situations, in general, if someone's just over that financial um, eligibility limit for main care, they'll be able to come to us and find um, quite affordable insurance. And we always want to emphasize that because I certainly hear um, from folks who say, you know, what happens, there's sort of a cliff you drop off um, and really want them to know, even though we're a different program, you know, we're here for those individuals um, and ready to help and really want to make sure that they're aware of CoverMe.gov um, and, and able to come over uh, to us if they need us. Um, on the next slide, have just an overview of special enrollment periods. Um, so CoverMe.gov is different than Mean Care in that we are not um, open and can't accept applications from everyone all year round. We have an open enrollment period um, that uh, typically runs November 1st to January 15th for um, annual coverage. But outside of that time, um, individuals can come in and apply if they've experienced what we call a qualifying life event, um, making them eligible for a special enrollment period. Loss of mean care becoming ineligible because of changes in circumstance um, already does qualify uh, for one of those special enrollment periods known as loss of minimum essential coverage, which right now is available for 60 days before and after uh, the loss of coverage date. Um, but in light of the public health emergency end and, you know, the volume of consumers that are going to be experiencing this as well as potential confusion caused by the change and the fact that they've been receiving renewal notices previously that haven't been acted on, we're going to be extending uh, that window for consumers losing mean care specifically to 90 days uh, before or after the uh, date of the event, just to give a little bit more time, particularly, again, if someone is unaware, if they've missed a notice um, and, you know, maybe find out that they've lost coverage only when they visit a provider um, that will give some extra flexibility there. Um, and that special enrollment period will be available via self-service through CoverMe.gov, meaning that they won't need to call our Consumer Assistance Center. They can select that life event and should be able to enroll if they are within um, the valid dates. <clears throat> We also uh, this year have another special enrollment period um, that's newly available as of uh, this year, 2022, um, for individuals who uh, are um, have income below 150 cent at or below 150% of the federal poverty level. So as we have here about $19,000 for an individual or just under 40,000 for a family of four um, that can allow them to enroll at any time of the year if they are eligible for advanced premium uh, tax credits that financial assistance that I discussed, um, which gives a little bit of added flexibility. Again, if someone is just over um, you know, that threshold for Medicaid eligibility, they can come um, to us uh, even if you know, they're outside of the 90 days. The one thing I'll add on this slide is uh, just to be aware, um, both these special enrollment periods um, have an effective date of coverage, which is the first day of the month following the date that a plan is selected. Um, so the coverage is not retroactive um, or available immediately when someone applies. Um, I think that can you know, create some risk of um, gaps in coverage for individuals, certainly. So we really encourage people who 
may be ineligible for main care if they know that uh, review or renewal is coming up to sort of be on top of it if they are able to to come to us and apply um, right away and, and try to avoid that um, gap in coverage. I will say if you um, have an individual who experiences that gap um, because of, you know, again, a missed notice or, um, uh, you know, just having uh, become aware right towards the end of a month, um, you can call our call center um, and check in with them about an exceptional circumstances, um, special enrollment period to potentially um, allow for a different effective date, but that will be the standard is first day of the month following uh, the selection of a plan. And we'll be taking a few actions um, to really try to encourage this population who may be eligible through CoverMe.gov um, to come back to us and to apply. Um, I will say, uh, just to add one thing, when an individual um, is found ineligible for main care um, because of income or other changes in eligibility factors, their account is transferred over to CoverMe.gov. Um, so we receive an inbound account transfer. Much of the application will be populated with information that was entered um, in their main care application or their renewal forms, any up-to-date information that OFI has will come to us. Um, and individuals can claim uh, those accounts and sort of find that application just by creating an account um, with the same primary member who uh, applied for main care. Um, so very simple in a household of one. But if you are working with a family, then having them make sure that the same individual who was kind of the primary applicant through main care um, creates the account through CoverMe.gov will make sure that they're connected to that existing application. Um, they will need to go through it and just resubmit um, to receive a determination with us but it helps to expedite the process because they won't have to enter all of their information from scratch. Um, for those consumers, we're going to be doing some targeted uh, outreach, um, sending a series of welcome to CoverMe.gov um, mailings to them that will be, uh, our plan is to have those be a little bit more eye-catching than the typical, you know, folded notice in a white envelope, um, a little bit more uh, visually um, noticeable, so postcards, um, you know, glossy one-pagers, um, really to try to make sure that we capture their attention um, and hoping to co-brand at least one of those with the Office for Family Independence so folks can connect to us with them and, and understand understand that we are not, um, you know, a, a private company marketing to them, but um, a, a government program. Um, and we'll also, uh, to the extent we're able to, based on the availability of contact information, as well as some um, issues we're working through in terms of um, consumer permission, uh, planning to send follow-up emails, um, texts, and hopefully some phone calls as well um, to those consumers if we haven't heard from them after the mailing campaign to, again, encourage them uh, to come in and, and seek coverage from us. It's an unusual situation for us to sort of know of an audience of individuals who we're fairly confident have lost coverage fairly confident need coverage and so we really want to make sure we do everything that we can to um, you know capture their attention bring them in and have them submit an application with us so that we can get them enrolled all right um, thank you Meg um, so the last section here is how can you help um, why are you on this call um, why did the state kind of bring you in to this conversation um, the reality is, uh, we all know that main care members will benefit from hearing this from multiple places and from trusted partners. And if you're on this call, you're a trusted partner. Um, you're someone that, that the state recognizes has a, a relationship with main care members and can help us do outreach and inform members about the coming of the PHE and what will be necessary, um, what steps folks will have to go to in order to maintain their coverage. Um, the at, here at Maine DHHS, we're going to be incorporating enrollment and eligibility and assistance into uh, several programs that are cross office programs. Um, Maine Care is going to be partnering with the Office of Health Insurance Marketplace and with the Office of Population and Health Equity out of the out of Maine CDC in order to uh, knit together a cohesive strategy and an outreach approach to make sure that people are hearing these messages. Um, and we're hoping that you will be part of that strategy, um, that you will be educated and aware about the public health emergency, be listening for when we get the final word that it ends, and in your interactions with main care members, um, be raising some of the key messages that we need raised uh, in order to ensure uh, coverage maintenance through for folks who might be losing their coverage due to the end of the public health emergency. Um, so this effort is going to be su supported by um, a media campaign and 
toolkit. There will be resources available. We have, uh, we're working to secure a media vendor to create a partner toolkit um, that we will be able to provide to agencies like yours. Um, it will be on a website that you can download. Um, there will be radio advertising, social media advertising. There will be uh, transit campaigns, um, uh, search advertising. Uh, and these, these outreach efforts about the public health emergency are going to be intertwined with existing main care efforts around CHIP um, and new efforts around new eligibility groups. Um, we're looking at doing outreach in multiple languages. Um, so you should know that there are resources to support this outreach work as you talk to main care members. Um, we are still in development, working on um, putting those together, but we will have those for, for you to do this work in, in the communities you work in. Um, what are the key messages we need to get out there? We want folks to update their contact information. This is, this is something that people can do now. They can go to My Main Connection, set up an account, update their contact information. If you have, uh, if you have regular communication with main care members, we want you to be passing that message on start, immediately, starting today. We need that updated contact information if when it comes time for renewal, they're gonna receive the renewal forms. Um, folks who can't go to My Main Connection don't have to. They can call the 1-855 number, which is not exactly a 1-800 number, but basically. Um, and just so that uh, everyone is aware, there's a, you don't have to wait for a call specialist. Um, there's a way to kind of bypass and update your contact information really quickly. Um, that's a key message that we should be passing out and that we would be hopeful that when you have interaction with main care members, you're passing out from now until when we get word that the public health emergency is ending. Um, and then when it's, once we get that word and it's actually time to kind of go live with, we really need to get the word out to members about the public health emergency and their, their need to renew. Um, as Tony mentioned, it's going to be that blue stripe envelope. Look for that blue stripe envelope. Make sure you're paying attention. Fill out what's in there. Um, we're going to need to do that. That that's going to be once we know the PHE is ended. Um, and also, it's important to note that the envelope um, and the the forms in there can also be done at my main connection. Um, that's a that's a real easy pathway. So these are, I mean, they're simple messages. Um, but we're going to be looking to get those out broadly, um, starting immediately with please update your contact information. Um, so again, just to kind of end on this, the, the next steps, um, we don't yet know the end date of the public health emergency. Until it's announced, if you could assist us in spreading word to members that we need to keep contact information up to date, and that's the, the best pathway um, for, for maintaining continuous coverage and making sure that we can reach you when that time comes. Um, and secondly, uh, we're gonna be paying attention for November 12th. We're waiting for that 60 day notice um, to find out if the public health emergency will be ending in January or if it may be delayed for another 90 days. Um, and lastly, this webinar, these slides, uh, OFI's plan for outreach, a number of resources, a, a FAQ for, um, for members uh, will be available on maincare.gov backslash PHE. Um, we will be providing that information widely. We want people to know about the public health emergency unwinding plan, um, but uh, we, you will be able to, if, if you have folks on your team who, need this information, but weren't able to make this meeting, they'll be able to watch the recording of the meeting uh, at maincare.gov backslash PHE. Um, now we are at about one hour and we have time remaining to address your questions. So uh, I'm sure we have quite a few of them in the chat. I haven't been watching it since I've been steering the PowerPoint. Um, but uh, I will hand this off for any questions. Eric, really quickly, I'll just, I just wanted to note that um, the website, the maincare.gov slash PHE, 
Um, I don't think that is live right this second, but we are expecting it to go live uh, very shortly. So if you go and it doesn't take you to where you're expecting, um, I would say try tomorrow um, is, is your best bet. We are uh, in the process of making sure that that goes live. Thanks, Michelle. I was going to jump in. There was one question about the um, process of account transfer um, from OFI to CoverMe.gov and asking if that only applied um, if individuals had used by main connection um, to process their review. Uh, that's not the case. Anybody um, with a main care, um, with main care membership, main care enrollment, um, if they're disenrolled, we would get that account transfer. It comes from sort of the back end um, ACES system over to us. So regardless of the pathway that someone took to initially apply or to complete their renewal, um, we'll receive that information from them if uh, it's transferred to us. Great. There are also a couple of questions about will materials be provided in multiple languages? Um, I don't know uh, if someone uh, from OFI can um, jump in um, on that question, which came up a couple times. Sure. Um, I've been answering some of those questions in the chat. So, um, but just to let everybody know, the eligibility system does not currently have a mail option that allows for customization to primary languages other than English. What will happen when we mail out a review and we know that your primary language is not English, there will be a interpretive services document included with the review that provides information on how to contact uh, in interpretive services that are provided by OFI. One option, however, is you could go to my main connection if you get your review. And Dan can speak to this a little bit more if if people want, but I believe that our new My Main Connection does allow for multi-language um, information to be displayed. So you using the Google browser, for example, you would have the ability to select your primary language to review the materials in, in that way. Um, Dan, is that more to add to that? Yeah, I can add to that briefly. That is accurate. There is, you know, the, the new My Main Connection supports the, you know, various browsers translation services. We recognize that that is not um, perfect. Uh, and in some cases, substantially short of perfect. There is also, however, a panel at the top of the new My Main Connection um, in a number of different languages that our clients speak that pops out a prompt in their language, their, their uh, chosen language uh, about how to access translation services for free through us to help um, with various activities that they may be doing. Um, in addition to those things, and, and this was covered briefly in one of the slides, I wanted to note that we are hoping to roll out to supplement the different noticing um, campaigns that we would ordinarily um, at least email, but also potentially text message outreach to all the members for whom we have that type of contact information for. Um, so if we have the email address of somebody and we know that their native language is Afro-Somali, for example, we are providing that message in actually translated service to the top, I think four languages spoken beyond English that we are aware of. So in the, the two, two messages we're preparing to send are uh, to basically to coincide with the quarterly message saying, hey, you know, the public health emergency is over, make sure you look out for a recertification um, in the next several months and respond with with um, with that filled out. That's going to go in email at least uh, and potentially as well in text message um, as a complement to what we're sending in paper in paper mail. And likewise, when the when the recertification goes out again to the you know to in English and is and also in the top three or four, I think it's four most commonly spoken other languages to, um, among our clients. We're going to be sending a reminder um, that the that the renewal is due, and that will continue to go out every seven days until we get back. I will also just jump in to say, in terms of the um, the communications and media contract that we're working on, we are also uh, going to be looking into having toolkit um, materials and information and uh, media 
a translated where possible into multiple languages as well. Eric, I don't know if you'd say anything else beyond that. Yeah, um, I was just going to add, we are working in partnership with the Office of Population Health Equity to figure out the most effective strategy for getting uh, this messaging out as, uh, as broadly as possible and to as many language communities as possible. Um, so their support and kind of um, process for that is, is critical for our success on that. And on the partner outreach piece, there was also a question about, you know, would there be shareable information that um, those are items that we are working to develop. Um, as Eric mentioned, we'll have a partner toolkit um, and we'll make sure that we uh, keep this group updated, but also at that maincare.gov slash PHE site, um, we'll continue to update as more resources and materials are available. I, and, and I'll actually go one step further than that. We are, we're working with the Office of Population and Health Equity to um, supplement some contracts in order to do outreach in an active way um, and have a convening agent that can help keep um, organizations up to speed on the latest on the public health emergency unwinding. So, um, so this isn't just a toolkit that we're going to be emailing you. This is convening conversations like these, hoping, you know, working through questions that organizations might have that might be specific to populations you're working with um, in order to really provide uh, a, a complete picture of what, what this looks like. Um, so you can go to communities and be um, responsive to their questions. Great. I think we were, uh, we have several questions um, just sort of with different scenarios around the renewal timeline. And if somebody updated their information in 2022, when they would come up in 2023. Um, and I think, uh, turn it over to Leah to sort of walk through that again. Yeah, so we have a bunch of questions in the chat regarding the timeline. So I'm going to try to hit them all at once here. Um, one of them was related to uh, if we receive uh, notice that the PHE is ending in November um, and somebody has a renewal in that 60 day period. So let's say November, they have a renewal of 2022. When is their renewal going to be um, in the unwinding period? So they're still going to get their November renewal, the November 22 renewal. Uh, that's their opportunity to their, update their contact information, give us anything else they need to tell us. But their actual renewal deadline for the, the PHE will be November 2023. So their coverage will continue until November 2023 if their um, renewal is scheduled during that 60-day notice period. There were a couple other questions about the timeline. So um, for this example specifically, if somebody has a renewal due in April, which is means we have to get it back by April 30th, and they send in their information the following month, a day late, um, what is going to happen to their coverage? So if the renewal is not back with us and logged in uh, in our system on April 30th, that individual's uh, coverage could end. So it may end, uh, we'll, we'll complete the renewal still, if they're eligible, we'll re-enroll them, but it definitely needs to get back before the due date. Um, and there are multiple different ways that will be in the actual renewal form itself and in the reminder notice telling people, you know, how important it is, don't wait, do it now, send it back immediately, you can mail it to us, you can fax it to us, you can uh, go online and take care of it, you can call us and do it over the phone, you can walk into an office, um, and maybe even missing email. There are a bunch of different options that are on there. Um, they are also in the FAQs that will be posted online on that website that was mentioned at the end of the presentation uh, to provide all of that information. Scan through and see if I'm missing any questions about renewal notices. Don't see any additional unanswered questions about renewal notices. You want to take some of the other ones right now? We have time.
Great. There was um, a question uh, raised about whether um, there would be uh, a sister access for the My Main Connection um, site. I know that's uh, newly launched, and so folks might not be as familiar with it. Um, Dan, do you want to speak to that? Sure. Uh, I didn't see that question, but Tony uh, prompted me that there was one, so I'm ha happy to cover it. Um, we are working on a, a second um, deployment of the My Main Connection site that will make a, for a pretty robust uh, additional level of access to assisters um, and re authorized representatives to manage cases for a number of people. Um, that is something we've, we're, we've done a lot of work on it. We're, we've got a lot more work to do so that the eligibility system itself can accept that information. I'm currently targeting next summer to, to roll that out, which is certainly um, late for the public health emergency unwinding, but it's as early as we can implement it. Great, thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions about when um, co-pays will start, whether that's with the end of the PHE um, or what the timing for that would be. Uh, so the co-pays are generally supposed to start at the end of the PHE. We did or are requesting a waiver from CMS to wait until the actual renewal is due. So as long as that is approved, um, co-pays for individuals such as Katie Beckett, uh, Cub Care, um, uh, SBW or special benefit waiver plan, those types of groups, uh, sorry, not co-pays, premiums will be um, uh, started when they do their final renewal. Uh, for co-pays, Michelle or OMS, can you answer the question about co-pays? Um, I can say that the co-pays uh, would start no sooner than the end of the public health emergency. Um, I will note that uh, there was a budget initiative to end co-pays for FQHCs um, and RHC visits. Uh, so just as a note, um, there, there will, uh, uh, those co-pays um, will not be turning back on. Um, uh, we are, uh, I also want to clarify that not all all co-pays that have ended during the public health emergency. So we'll put together a more precise communication on, on timing with co-pays, um, generally speaking. Great, thank you. Um, on the communication, um, forms of communication side, someone um, has asked if someone created an account on My Main Connection and opted into text and email reminders only, will they still receive the blue stripe envelope in the mail? No. But so if, if someone selects uh, e-noticing uh, for the My Main Connection portal, the same as with the old portal, they, they will get um, all key messages from us, except for a couple things that have different privacy levels um, through that channel. So they'll be reminded that there is a message there or be alerted that there is a message there via text or email, and then they will need to visit the site in order to get their renewal. Thank you. Um, there is a question about main care eligibility of adult asylum seekers. Um, I'm not sure if anyone uh, is prepared to speak to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what the question is, if it's related to the PHE or Right now, there is no change to adult no. asylum seekers main care eligibility right now. Um, there is yeah, the maybe. new coverage group for uh, children under the age of 21 and pregnant individuals. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't know of any other changes to the asylum seekers for adult. And I was just gonna add, that was effective on July 1. Um, and it was for a set of people who are legally present, and so it's not all people who are legally present, right, Michelle? Do you know those rules earlier? Um, so it's for individuals um, who would otherwise be eligible for main care uh, due to income, et cetera, but aren't due to their immigration status. So those are the individuals under age 21 or individuals who are pregnant who, as of July 1, 2022, are eligible for um, state-funded uh, main care. Uh, it, Leah, it might be helpful, though, just to state what the regular 
policy per federal regulations is for asylum seekers, because that might have been part of the question. Yeah, asylum seekers, uh, especially the adult population generally, are only eligible for emergency services. Um, that still remains true, but now. So no change due to the PHE um, and winding. Correct. Um, I think there was, uh, I know we are uh, trying to make sure that we are answering some of the more common um, questions that have come up. Um, I think there was a question about the, um, the uh, automated um, phone system, the IVR, and how people can use that as, as a sort of way of updating their information, especially. I know there were some questions about folks who may not have email addresses or access to my main connection through that. Um, and I know we touched on that in the presentation, but Dan, do you want to just talk, sort of talk through what that would look like? Sure, I'd be happy to. I'm, I'm still doing not the best job of following along all the question, questions, but um, the, I, I I called the um, 855 number yesterday so, so I could you know get a feel for what the, the current experiences of, of callers, recognizing that we have a pretty long wait time if someone needs to speak to an eligibility specialist about their case, not so long if they want to speak to a front, um, sort of the triage worker. But we also have a number of um, pre-recorded prompts that are that play. So there's a there's a lot of that someone has to listen through in order to you know hear directions about how to manage um, their call. Um, one of the, the prompts is currently promoting the new My Main Connection. And I think you know, we're gonna leave that up for a little while longer because I think we're getting some good um, traction out of it. Um, but you can skip those things. And if you, if you sit through those, those messages, you'll, you'll start to hear a menu of options. Um, and the, if, you, so if you press one on your keypad, it'll take you to the IVR system. Uh, and it'll prompt you to uh, enter the last four digits of your social security number, so it can connect you to the, the case and that, and, and then follow the prompts um, to update, for example, your address that way without having to speak to anybody live at all. Um, and then it, it, there's no, I, I think that there was a, a question earlier about whether there's anything that verifies that that has been received. There's nothing that goes out separately from the call, but the, the automated, um, service will acknowledge that it has received your update asking if you want to make another one and then it will terminate the call if you don't. I hope that answers the question. Great, thanks very much. Um, I know there are uh, a number of uh, a number of other questions that I think have, many of which have been um, addressed in this presentation. Um, so I'm also trying to concurrently scan um, and make sure if there are um, options uh, or information that we haven't already shared. Um, I think I would just say uh, live update hot off the presses, um, maincare.gov slash PHE is live. Um, so great um, to have that um, information available. Um, there were a few questions about whether this these resources would be shared. Um, that'll be the place that we will keep updated sort of throughout, um, both with um, resources and materials, with those toolkits that we've talked about. Um, and uh, as there's more data, of course, as we get live into the PHE, we'll, we'll look to continue to keep um, all of you, our trusted partners, updated. Um, through that site um, and make sure that we uh, that we are trying to be responsive both to the need for materials for outreach as well as um, you know assistance in answering um, any questions that arrive. Um, I think that we uh, I think that's where uh, we will leave it today. I think we'll make sure that we um, get folks updated information on maincare.gov slash PHE and that we will, um, let everyone know, um, as there are more information, you can continue to, uh, bookmark that site and refresh it. Um, and, uh, we look forward to all your partnership, really appreciate, um, everyone on this call and the work that you're doing and will be doing, um, to make sure the people you work with are, um, uh, you know, are, are aware that, you know, that, um, we are, working together as a unified department um, to really keep folks covered and um, that we're 
going to be communicating um, through every avenue that we can to, to make sure that that happens. Um, so I think with that, um, I don't know if there's any final remarks um, from anyone, but I think we just want to thank you all for joining today and, and for the partnership going forward. Yep, this is Jean. I'll just say thanks in advance. We'll be calling on you all for help as we go through this process. These partnerships will be essential to make sure that main people affected by unwinding know their options. So again, we have a lot of work ahead of us, but hopefully with good planning, good communication, we'll meet this challenge and maintain coverage in Maine. So thank you all.